Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, your director has given a very, very, very formal introduction. Okay, so let me be quite informal. Uh, yes, as Dr. Champa said, I have worked in all these places, but you should also know that uh, Dr. Champa is a very good friend of mine. We have worked together under each other, along with each other, and I'm very happy to be a part of SVS. Yes, I was a director of SVS once upon a time, I should say that. Uh, that was long ago, a decade back. Uh, your first batch, second batch students must be knowing about it. Is the screen visible? Yes, it is visible. It is visible, okay. Uh, you have to go to the slide. Uh, this, uh, yeah. I've done it. Fully. I guess it takes a second difference or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, uh, today uh, the topic of presentation is museum acoustics means to eliminate the airborne and structure borne noise. Okay, now uh, to start off with, what is acoustics? Uh, you know that it is a part of, uh, it relates to sound. Now getting into the history of acoustics, Greeks were the first to uh, find out about the details of acoustics. So the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, he was the one who kind of invented, that is before the sixth century BC. Now, what exactly is acoustics? You would have learned in physics, incident wave, reflected wave, transmitted wave. So something like that, the generation, transmission and reception of sound in the form of vibrational waves that is called as acoustics, which is generally called as the signs of sound. Now, there are two Okay, two branches of acoustics. One is the physical acoustics, one is the architectural acoustics. So rather than saying two branches, which actually goes hand in hand because you need to know both. But now we will concentrate on architectural acoustics. So when we say acoustics, that means it is the kind of artificial part that we are looking into the building. So it is a kind of some kind of acoustical defects, sound defects inside a building. So you find out what the defects are, then you get ways to eliminate them. And finally you find a solution. And that is the acoustical treatment that we'll be talking about. So let's get into behavior of sound. Now, as I said, you have an incident wave, which we call as a noise source, then the reflected wave. And there is something called as absorption and transmission which is happening. So this is the kind of behavior of sound which 99.9% .9 happens when there is no kind of acoustical treatment in any of the building. Now, what is the behavior of sound in an enclosure? This is where acoustics is necessary. So you can see a lot, for example, if you see the section, you can see a piano, the sound uh, transmitted from the piano, it goes and hits the surface and then gets reflect back to the audience. Some of the sound is directly transmitted to the audience. The same way on the left hand side, you can see the uh, a room space where the sound is transmitted. It hits to all the surfaces. You have the ceiling, the walls, the floors. It hits everywhere and, it, and then it reaches the person. So this is the kind of behavior of sound in an enclosure. So. Now, if you see, as I said, there is reflection, absorption, transmission. There are a few other criteria also which we need to see, few other behavior of sound. So first is reflection, which you already know what it is. Second is absorption, meaning the material, the interior treatment of the building, it will absorb the sound depending upon what kind of treatment. So either it is going to be a normal wall or you have some absorptive material inside 
or even your curtains, the, your own clothing, your furnishings, all this leads to absorption. Next is refraction. So either the sound travels, travels straight from the source to the listener or it goes and hits another surface and then reaches the listener. Next is diffusion. The, so the sound travels in different ways. So if you stand in an open air and shout, it is not that the sound is traveling straight, left, right, 101 directions, minimum it will travel. Then diffraction. Diffraction is even if there is a small gap, the sound travels to that gap. And finally, it is transmission, the receiver end, from the source to the listener, the receiver end. Now, just a small thing. We know that humans, our uh, hearing ability is 20 hertz to 20,000 uh, 20, hertz, that is 20 kilohertz. But there are animals which can hear more than 20, and there are few animals which can hear less than 20. So I guess uh, animals which can hear more than 20, you can see here. Uh, it is the cat, rat, mouse and all that, but less than 20 is especially the elephant and the whales. The whales can listen to even 7 hertz. It reaches to that level. Okay. So when we have the sound coming in, the behavior of the sound, what are the kind of defects that you need to see? First is reverberation. Actually, reverberation is both. Uh, in simple words, it's both good and bad, if I say. Good because you know what exactly is reverberation? The sound waves hits the surfaces and it comes back. It reflects back to you. So this sound which reflects back to you is called as the reverberation and the timing of the reflection back to us. Now, this is continuous reflection. It comes where in this section you can see that or in this image you can see that from the source, the sound gets hits the ceiling to the rear wall, then to the person. So this is called as reverberation. But here, reverberation is both good and bad, I told you. Because the reverberation starts from 0 0.5 seconds to 5 seconds. So we start from very good, which is 0 0.5 to 5, which is very bad. That is the kind of criteria that we follow. So usually from 0 0.5 to 2 or 3 is maximum that we would like to have. And 3 is mostly fine in churches. Why? Because the height of the ceiling, the volume, the materials that is used. So something like even like auditoriums, music halls, convention centers, theaters, you can see it here. From, from 1, that is 0 0.5 till 3 is what you can see here. The next is echo. Now all of you would have stood on a mountain top and shouted out some name or a voice or whatever that is. So that which gets back to you repeatedly in a in the form of a fading sound that is called as echo. Even if you stand in a normal room without any furniture and you clap or you shout, you can hear that noise for a long time because there is no absorptive material in that room. It's an empty room. So this is another defect. The third defect being sound foci. Now sound foci is what? From the source to the listener, the sound reaches. But what happens because of the kind of geometry of the uh, room or the building, or because there is no kind of acoustical treatment, all the sound gets focused onto one point. So the rest of the places, there is no sound. And that is called as the dead spot or a sound shadow. Below you can see what a sound shadow is. Here you can see the section of an auditorium where you can see the auditorium seating plus a balcony a number which is written there for the balcony. Now you can see below the balcony, you can see those dots, that shaded portion. That is where the sound shadow falls. That is just because the sound doesn't reach because of the projection of the balcony in the auditorium. As a thumb rule, when you design an auditorium and you have a balcony, as a thumb rule, you're supposed to see that your projection of the balcony should be only one third of the total length of the auditorium from the stage to the rear wall. So we follow one third. For example, if your length is 20, then you need to go for one third, six point something that you need to go for. Usually the length of the hall from the stage to the rear wall is 23 meters, which we follow in, in a normal auditorium. So that is how a sound shadow is formed. Next is dead spots. As I told you, since everything is focused onto one point, the other places you will have these dead spots where the sound is not heard. In this section, again, you can see there are reflectors on the ceiling. The sound from the source is reaching to the reflectors and getting down to the audience there. 
but if you can see there are a few set of audience where the sound is not heard that is just because the reflectors are not placed in positions in the angle where the sound needs to reach the reflectors I and mean, the audience this is called as the dead spots okay now apart from this there is something which a human has the health effect so because of noise these are the kind of health effect which you will uh, kind of tension hypertension annoyance because of the loud sound night you're not able to sleep and then other uh, cardio that is whatever relates to heart those kind of diseases health effects you will have okay so when we say about acoustics generally there is something called as dead room and live room now live room is yes we know what it is you can see an image here which shows the musical instruments dead room is something below there now what exactly is a dead room is this is a room there which is built just to measure sound or certain uh, music part of it because there should not be any kind of reverberation or echo happening and this dead room actually is called as the anechoic chamber now here if a person is standing to do some kind of work it is not more than 45 minutes that the person can stand because there is no sound there is nothing that is happening inside this dead room next is if you see a live room i told you even an empty hall is a live room because when you make a noise it gets back to you it when it comes back to you as an echo but the other way around if you see this kind of a studio where it is a recording studio you can always you can see that the walls are paneled the floors has carpets wood is being used because all these are sound absorptive materials so you get a music which is very pleasing to your ear and this is called as a live room how does sound absorption happen usually there are four ways one is it is absorbed in the air one is the boundary surface one is the furnishings and one is we ourselves now how in the air because it is friction your physics because of friction next is as i said at the boundary surface that is your surface because of your walls floors ceilings furnishings furnishing means everything your upholstery the all the furnishes inside uh, your curtains everything the wall if it is paneled if you have a false ceiling everything adds on to it along with the audience the kind of clothing that we wear the number of people in the room you would have gone for movie theaters where you know that the whole place is crowded sometimes in theaters where only 3 or 4 would be there so you might feel the sound is more even the cooling of the room is more that's because all this depends upon the number of people and the kind of dress or the kind of material that you have worn this all adds on to the sound absorption okay generally when we go into acoustical design what are the conditions of a good design that we need to see is that you need to have a good sound amplification system you should not have any of the defects that we see for example the sound foci or the dead spots you should have very good geometry in the design that you are doing you should provide highly absorbent materials there should not be any kind of echo the reverberation must depend upon the kind of seconds that is already mentioned and if there is unwanted noise with with the help of acoustical treatment you should be able to absorb it now when we say for a conference hall or for a music hall the kind of acoustical design differs because in a conference hall from any point of the room even if it is a multi purpose hall from any point of the room if you stand and talk the acoustics should be correct there should not be any kind of echo but in a music hall it is different from the stage music hall or even a performing arts theater from the stage to the rear wall the sound should reach every person with the same intensity and frequency okay now let's get into design considerations this is where we will now go into detailing of a museum acoustics now there's nothing big about museum acoustics or auditorium acoustics there are a few things that we need to consider which is going to be which the criterias are going to be same for all so when we say design considerations the main three things that we need to see is our site selection the shape of our building and the construction and the treatment of the interiors so when we say site selection the first thing that we need to see is that there would there should not be any problem of noise so now that doesn't mean that i should select a site which is outside the or outskirts of the area no it can be inside a busy bay area also doesn't matter but then 
it depends upon how you are orienting your building for that kind of a site that is what we need to look into next is when according to orientation we also need to see that what how much less sound can get in so that means your background noise should not be more than 40 to 45 decibels shape now when we say shape the main thing that you need to consider is that you should not have any kind of defects like your echoes or dead spots or whatever the proper geometry needs to be taken care of so there if you see i have shown you an auditorium so usually an auditorium is fan shaped because that's the best kind of a shape that you can prefer for an auditorium but for museum that is not it right so for museum it will be usually rectangular halls so there your construction techniques and your interior treatment is what we need to see okay so usually in a building especially for your museum the kind of sound that is transmitted is airborne or structure borne so airborne is kind of so when i'm talking the sound comes out if it's loud it's a noise and if you have a machine above you or if you are walking the sound which goes below you to the other floor that is called as a structure bone so structure bone is through your walls and floors that the sound is going so when we say airborne so that means the airborne noise is generated in the air transmitted in the air but this airborne noise can go from one room to another i'm sitting and talking in this room from the next room it can be heard why because there are a few gaps to fill in that is your doors windows ventilators even your keyholes all these are the gaps through which the noise is transmitted via air from one room to another this next kind of noise is your structure bone as i told you structure bone is because of the uh, through the structures for example floor to floor even wall to wall now floor to floor how i'm staying in the first floor of a building night 10 o'clock second floor uh, what happens in the bedroom or in the dining room they're pulling the table you hear the noise and it is really irritating that is a kind of structure bone another kind of structure bone is you have a hot water pipe running through your walls yes or sometimes the water is rushing down through the pipes so you can hear that sound that is another kind of structure bone this is just an image to show from the first starting of the typical application without the treatment that you see is the noise so you can see a machine there where the noise comes out of the machine and also there's vibration from the machine which comes as structure bone so both air bone and structure bone so if you see from the second sketch to the last you can just see from the structure bone to the air bone what are the kinds of acoustical treatments that they do either you mask the machine or mask the point where the sound comes or you have a barrier between you and the machine or you are walking in an enclosed space and seeing what it is so it is kind of from non application to the total application that you can have for you around you and around the inside the building for all the kinds of surfaces planes okay now let's get into the actual construction part now uh, you must be looking at this uh, sketch and smiling to yourself yeah this was in the starting stages of my teaching career where we never had these projectors and it was the overhead projector so we had to use those uh, transparent sheets and work on it more than but somehow, i felt this is the best way of teaching that's why now this is where we are going to talk about the con uh, construction now coming down to the construction techniques and the treatment of the surfaces this kind of a construction which you see here is called as the discontinuous construction why because you have your normal floor wall and ceiling but you have something suspended from the ceiling and the wall and something floating on the floor also so the floating floor is on the structural slab the suspended ceiling which we also call as a false ceiling and you have a suspended wall now it doesn't mean that you need to suspend the wall it can be also called as cladding which is attached to the wall or you have an air gap in between a vacuum space also so this is a kind of sound i was talking about which is called as the impact sound so when we get down into the floating floor now this floating floor is used in places where usually you have heavy machineries but in museum you don't have that museum what is there you have a lot of floating population 
So what happens is you can have a normal concrete floor, above it you can have your wooden floor with carpet on that. And between your wooden floor and the concrete floor, you can have some kind of filling which you see here, which is called as a resilient material, mineral wool, fiber wool, whatever. So this, this carpet plus the floating floor plus the resilient material inside avoids the kind of noise from floor to floor because there are a lot of people walking, you walk with normal slippers, you walk with high heels, pointed heels, so you get a sound tuck, tuck, tuck when you walk. So all that can be avoided. Next is your suspended wall. Now if you see here, you can see the wall is there and there is also a wooden frame. But the below images, you can also see that there's kind of cladding which is being done or a carpeting which is being done. These days we get these wall carpets also. So all these are a part of sound absorptive or sound absorption methods. Suspended ceiling, obviously your false ceiling. Now here, what you need to notice your false ceiling. Now, in this construction technique that you see the false ceiling, I hope you can see the suspenders. In earlier stages, these suspenders were 60 centimeters apart. Now they say the minimum should be 1.2 meters. Why? Because you have your floor wall, I mean uh, the ceiling, and then you have these suspenders which you drill into the ceiling. So what happens? You are drilling, a hole is being formed. That means you are welcoming more sound from the upper floors to your floor. So the lesser the drilling, the lesser the suspenders, the better sound insulation. Yes, so you have these false ceiling, which, which is uh, at the interval of, uh, the suspenders are at an interval of uh, 1.2 meters minimum. These days it is more than that, but minimum 1.2 meters. And then you can use all kind of false ceiling, starting from thermocol, gypsum, plaster of Paris, any kind of fiber, any kind of acoustical foam, acoustical panel. So below what you see, the images are the images of a museum where the ceiling, what you see is, the, you have seen that they've done good, very good interior furnishings, furnishes and you also see those lights because museum, the light is a very important criteria. So that goes with the acoustics, that goes with the interior treatment finishes, yes? Okay, now we were talking about all the kinds of construction here. So when we are talking about a suspended ceiling, now, that was the last thing which you saw, the suspended ceiling. You need to be very careful that few things that you need to see. The weight of the material which you're using as false ceiling. It should be a lightweight material rather. And then you should uh, have less of noise penetration. And when you're making the false ceiling, if there is any gaps, you should use acoustic sealant to fill that up. And uh, as I said, the number of suspensions from the ceiling should be very less. And as apart from that, you should have some kind of sound absorptive material, which is fixed onto the suspended ceiling. Now sound insulation in the walls, there are many ways. Normally we use a nine inch wall. Now this can be different kinds of walls. One is your normal nine inch wall. The more thickness the wall, the lesser sound travels, but now uh, there are four types in this. One is the rigid homogeneous, one is the porous partitions, one is the double wall, one is the cavity wall. So the first one, what I was talking about is a normal wall. It can be quite thick enough for the sound not to travel. The second one is your walls with porous material so the sound absorption can happen. And here the sound absorption happens 10% more than your normal walls. The third one that you see is double wall. Now, where do we use these double walls? Usually double walls or even the fourth one, the cavity walls are used where it places the sound absorption is more necessary. Even the absorption of your signals is more necessary, like your uh, broadcasting studios, recording studios, your uh, operation theaters, institute of speech and hearing, all these places you need this. But when you have a cavity wall, that means the cavity wall, you can have some kind of material inside. So you see, you can see it here. Now cavity wall is two walls. So see double wall and cavity wall, the difference is double wall, you have the same thickness of wall on both, both. Either you fill the gap or you don't fill the gap. But in cavity wall, the difference being that your exterior wall is more thicker and your interior wall is thinner comparatively. 
two different materials can be used and you can fill in the gap either with vacuum or with some kind of resilient materials. Now, these days you have something called as a sandwich panel or the composite wall where all kinds of materials are put in together so that lesser sound is entering in. There is a lot of sound absorption which is happening. Now, even the sound absorption for windows and doors. So you would see double glazed window. It is for both sound and thermal insulation. Yes. And for doors, you can use doors which has got acoustical material. The door itself is made of a acoustical material. And the windows, when you have double glazed, the space between the double glazed, you need to be very careful what you are doing with the space. Either you can fill it with something or you can leave it just like that depending upon what is the function beyond that glass, that ventilation. Another thing is your, uh, the sound, when you open the door, there's a creak sound. So you can have some kind of sound, uh, sound absorbing material between the frame and the jam. Now, irrespective of all this, you can even use heavy curtains in these doors and windows. Now, heavy curtains meaning to control the sound absorption, even to control the reverberation. Now, there are different kinds of materials which are being used for the sound absorption, for the acoustical part, even in museums or in general buildings. So these are the different kinds of materials which is shown here. So when we say museums, then it is your floating floor, all the construction techniques that you need to use, apart from which your walls can be extra paneled, your floors need to have good carpets, your ceilings also, there should be some kind of all ceiling where the sound can be absorbed. Now, in your, uh, sorry, in your museum, it is not that that you have only places where there is exhibition. In certain places, you will have your audio visual room. So your audio visual room, the construction should be equivalent to an auditorium, a small auditorium. And then you might have conference rooms where meetings happen. So there you need to see what kind of furnishings you're using, what kind of wall treatment you're using. So. The next part of it you'll be seeing of the materials is how is planning helping you generally in designing your museum. Okay, so these are the different kinds of materials where you have rugs, curtains, paints, fiberglass. So here you can see the gypsum board, you can see the fiber wool, you can see the coir, you can see the acoustical foam, you can see the rug, and uh, here you can see the acoustical door, acoustical paint, acoustical wall covering, curtains, hall ceilings. Apart from this, there is something called as the baffles. Where in the museum, can you see something just being suspended? These are acoustical materials, which also absorbs the sound. And then you have an eco absorber, which is made of cotton. And you have acoustical partitions. Now these acoustical partitions can be even simple. Even your softboard, which you use to pin up your sheets, those have acoustical absorptive material in it. And your gypsum, all these wooden partitions, your glass partitions, everything is a part of acoustical treatment. Apart from all this, there's something called as natural acoustics. The more vegetation you have, the more green space you have, the more of a, the more of a live acoustics, natural acoustics that you can bring in because you know that vegetation absorbs sound Noise, noise pollution, environmental pollution, thermal insulation, everything. Okay, now we saw about all the artificial things which you're doing for the treatment. Now let's get down into the natural ways. Now the natural ways is your site. So that means planning of your site. When you do your site plan or master plan, we put in our buildings, then what we do? Exactly we do. You just take a few plants, put it there, here. No. When you do this, you need to know how to approach the entry of your building, your museum. If the site is in such a way that one side of your site is a national highway and then you're approaching through that national highway or you're approaching through a main road, the orientation of your building in your principles of architecture, you would have learned the approaches, oblique approach, straight approach, right angle approach. So you need to use, think, take that into consideration when you're designing. The approach should be different. Even if you're walking a bit, it is fine. The approach should be such a way that you have zoned your building in the silent area of your site. Apart from this, you need to have certain barriers. Now, what is the barriers? The barriers can be the soil itself. 
you can have a lot of vegetation you can bring in vegetation in terms of from lawns to shrubs to plants to trees depending upon whether it is your deciduous trees or evergreen trees or fruit whatever that depends and inclusion of waterscapes or even a combination of all this including your thick compound wall also in it this is a museum in abu dhabi now you must be thinking why i'm showing you this just see the total building it is surrounded by water so now you know how much of noise is absorbed by water yes so this is a very recent museum which came up you have a lot of sound absorptive materials in here i'm not getting down into the design part of it this is just for you to know that even water without any vegetation because you know uae vegetation is quite less comparatively to india so water itself acts as a sound absorbing material and this is inside an island sadiat island fully surrounded by water now the main things that you need to see is in your site plan your master plan what you're seeing is distance as i said from your main road you need to see that your building is in a very uh, silent area and also the approach to the building so you orient your building in such a way that the sound doesn't reach inside and uh, when you have your museum you will have other blocks service blocks dining block whatever kind of blocks you have so you need to have these blocks as barriers to your main blocks that is one thing another thing is your spatial arrangement when you say spatial arrangement it is your functions inside your exhibition spaces your gallery spaces your museum spaces inside it has to be arranged in such a way that all other rooms which gives noise should be either you have two options either from away from it or surrounding it can be surrounding because the wall can be made more sound proofed those windows can be made more sound proofed so your you are it's kind of you inside the core part of the building where it is noise free less sound then it is your vegetation when it comes to vegetation as i said you can have a lot of trees why even inside you can have but it depends how the moisture content of the plant inside is going to affect your exhibits that you should be very careful but otherwise your building can be surrounded by trees now trees you need to see you cannot have fast growing trees you need to have slow growing trees and trees which have a lot of uh, foliage because that reduces the uh, sound which en which enters into the building okay now apart from that something else is the natural acoustic wonders in a building in india is your gulgumbas and your uh, golconda fort now if you had visited bijapur if you have gone for the trip you would know why i am talking about this so i'm not going to give an explanation it's just for you to know about this thank you very much for giving this opportunity i guess that's it so if you have any